When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, what Thou hast told me to say It is well, is well with my soul It is well with my soul Sin not in part 
Happy Mother's Day, Mama. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day, Mom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. We love you. Say Happy Mother's Day, Beetle. Happy Mother's Day, Mommy. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, Mom. These are a few things we would like to say about you. You give the most amazing hugs and kisses. You are stupendous. You are awesome. <laughs> Hi, Dawn. Happy Mother's Day. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. We love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. We love you so much. You're the best. We really are the best. Ellie agrees. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. I love you. I love you. Mama. Happy Mother's Day, Ron Ron. We love you. <gasps> Happy Mother's Day. I love her. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. We, we love, love you. Thank you for being the best, best mom ever. ever. Happy, Happy Mother's Day. Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you this much. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. We love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mommy. We love you. Happy birthday, Mommy, too. Hey moms, happy Mother's Day. I pray that you're spoiled today by your family. I hope you have a great day. We're so thankful for you, grateful to God for who you are in the life of your family. Um, a godly mother is hard to find, and so we thank you for the sacrifices that you make, the things that you do that nobody even sees, to care for your family, to um, help your husband, to raise your kids in the teaching and instruction of the Lord. We're grateful for you. We hope today is an encouragement to you as well. We're also thankful for the rest of you that are joining us today. We hope that you'll let us know that you're here. It's good to be together as the people of God worshiping this morning. I got a couple of thoughts for you this morning, a couple updates. There's a lot going on in the life of the church, even in the midst of Zoom meetings and not being able to join. First of all, uh, we're really excited to offer in-person worship gatherings starting next Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, stay tuned for more information. We've put together a, a FAQ for you so you know a little bit more detail about what next Sunday is going to look like if you're wanting to come but you want to know some details. And so look for that on the weekly email. Look for that on our website um, as well as on our, our social media pages. So FAQ is posted all over those places. We also want you to know if you're, if you're not quite ready to join us, um, we understand that. We want to provide an option for you at home to continue to worship from home. And so we'll have a live uh, stream option that we're really working hard on uh, this week. It'll be different than pre-recorded sermons, uh, but that live stream we're working to make really good for you and your family so you can still join us from home. Um, our plans as we move forward, honestly, are still in pencil. I've laid out a lot of plans, and yet things are so are, are changing. And so our plans are in pencil. We'll adapt and change as we need to. We want you to know that, but we'll communicate with you as anything changes as we move forward. What did want to let you know that we had originally planned to have a family gathering or a members meeting on May 17th, but we've moved that meeting, that family gathering, which any of you are invited to in the church, if this is your home, church home, on, to May 31st. And so we'll do it at Legacy. Uh, I believe it's at 430, and that's going to be an opportunity for us to gather in person in the Legacy Gym. And we'll also probably live stream that as well if you're not able yet to, to join us. But we'll have worship and prayer. We'll hear some important updates about elder candidates. And we hope to um, affirm those candidates into uh, the elder team of the church on that day. We have some new members we want to introduce to you. So also we want to just kind of tell you where we're heading um, into the summer as best we know at this point with all this going on. And so those are some of our updates. We also want to let you know and remind you that the kids' meal still needs help. And so on Sundays after church, there's still an opportunity for you, even today on Mother's Day, to go to Silver Springs and help pass that meal to a lot of families in need still in our community. So that's the way we're trying to be the hands and feet of Christ during this 
interesting time to care for people's physical needs by providing meals. You can contact Jim um, Cone on that. You can let us know. Um, he's the one that's setting that up on our end, and so we can get you his information on that. Let me pray for us, and we will worship this morning. Thank you so much, Lord, for these mothers that we have in our church. We thank you for the way in which they serve and care for their families, um, all the Christ-like sacrifices that they make every day that are unseen to care for, for their kids and their husbands, maybe even especially in a time where kids are at home and not at school for some of our families. And so, Lord, we pray for them. We pray that by your spirit that you would give them strength um, and give them grace. We pray for husbands and kids. We pray for husbands and kids to encourage their moms, um, to love their moms, to remind their moms how much they mean to to them. And Lord, I pray that that wouldn't just be true on Mother's Day, but it would be true each day that we could supply one another the needs of encouragement to build each other up. And so, Lord, I pray that for our families. I pray that for our church. And Lord, I also we also realize that today's a really hard day for some people, a hard holiday for some people, some people who have lost their mothers. And so people who are not able to have kids, people who are estranged from their moms and all the other kinds of brokenness that comes with a day like today. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be a balm um, to the women in the room that have experienced any of these pains or, or more than that. Lord, I pray that you would care for them today as we honor mothers, which is right and good. Um, I pray that we'd be remembering moms, uh, remembering people in the room that this is a hard day for them and that you would care through your spirit for them. And we thank you for Jesus who takes all of our brokenness, um, whatever it looks like, and he is um, the great healer of our hearts. And so we thank you for Jesus that he died on a cross for our sins, that we might have life, that we could bring our cares to him. Lord, we pray for our service. We pray that uh, this would be a time where we honor you. It would be a time where we open ourselves to you, that you might minister to our hearts. And Lord, we pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, as we sit and listen to the teaching of your word, that you would um, convict our hearts that we might be a little bit more like Jesus every day and show us our need for your amazing grace. In Christ's name, amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind way it was my turn till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried Great. 
break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen. Measure 
Would you pray with me? Father, we're thankful for this morning. We get to uh, gather together, albeit online, to, to worship you. We thank you for a time of worship. We can sing praises to, to who you are. We thank you that you're a God of, uh, of grace, that extends your grace to us, not because we deserve it, but because you freely give it through your son, Jesus. And so we thank you for him. We thank you for what he's done for us on a cross. May we not be a forgetful people of the, the grace that we need every day. And Lord, we pray as we open your word, uh, I pray uh, that you would show us uh, more about who you are and more through your spirit of what you want to do in our lives to conform us more and more every day to the image of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what's the preferred image that you want people to see in your life? Maybe that's an image that is not intentionally portrayed, but what's the image? Um, What's the image on, if you go back and look at your social media post on Instagram or Facebook, what's the image that you project? Is it a mom who loves their family? Is it a dad who loves their family? Is it your kids? Is it your work? Uh, Is it a hobby that you have? What's the preferred image that you project Um, To do that, you kind of have to be selective as you post different things to make that work. You know, we've been studying the the life of Noah over the last few weeks. We've seen the flood. uh, We've seen his life. Um, And I want you to imagine just for a minute uh, if there was Facebook or Instagram or social media back in the day. I wonder what Noah's Facebook page would look like or his Instagram page would look like. Um, He would be likely the guy that you would love to hate. Like his life looks really perfect. Um, He's the guy that walked with God in his generation. Uh, Maybe you see a picture of the ark being built. Maybe you see a picture of him going through it. Um, The flood. Maybe you see a picture of, of God. Uh, shutting the door of the ark. Maybe see a picture of uh, after the flood and this covenant with God. But this is a man who walked with God. This is a man um, that maybe um, in the truth of the matter, you turn to your spouse and go, yeah, his life's really great. I wonder what it's really like. But today we come to the kink in the armor in Noah's life. We see um, a picture, a different picture of his life, a Uh, Maybe a closer up picture of his life that even if you tried to put on Facebook or Instagram that it would likely be censored. Um, And so this truth, when we look at his this passage today and we're going to see a a lot of sin and and disgrace that Noah brings upon himself. He brings upon his family. Um, You're going to see his sons respond or his son respond to it and. Um, receive consequences for that, the stumbling block that Noah provides. And it teaches us as people who, many of us who are seeking after God, who want to walk with God, that we are always in need of God's grace. Noah was in need of God's grace. Even though he was the one righteous man in his generation that sought God, we are always a people in need of God's grace. Do you, do you feel that in your life today? Do you feel and know that you are today in need of God's grace. Perhaps you're here this morning and you've never done business with God where you look at Christ and say, no thanks. Maybe somebody's invited you here. Maybe this is a time where you look at his saving grace. And many of you may be here this morning and you go, you know, I know God talks about his spirit's work in my life. I know the word talks about sustaining grace and my need for that. Um, do you realize that you need God's grace every day? Do you realize you need it in your personal, private life? Do you need it in your family life? Perhaps that's more uh, real for you right now with everybody huddled up in, in your home. Or are you spending so much time, perhaps, if I can dig, are you spending so much time with that image, with portraying and projecting an image of who you want to be? You've lost sight, maybe, even of your need of grace because you're working so hard to project an image. Well, we come to this text, which really is kind of a preacher's dream, if you will. This text, you see, um, as far as drama goes, you see Noah and his drunkenness and his um, nakedness, and then you see children rebellion, so kids pay attention this morning. Um, And we're also kind of stuck, it's Mother's Day, and so what's the message, moms, for this text? Um, Maybe it's just, again, a reminder of how much godly moms are needed for their families. 
amidst chaos. Maybe that's the message. Or maybe it's just that when we come to Father's Day and Mother's Day, we're reminding the men of their responsibilities. How about that one? But in all seriousness, when we come to this text, as we come to this passage today, I'm g- you're going to see this domino effect of sin just rolling out. But you see the bookends of God's grace in the beginning and the end. So it's a great passage to remind us that we're always in need of God's grace. So let me read the passage, Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 through 29, and we'll walk through this drama. Uh, God's word says this, the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed or populated. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered, naked in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, there it is again, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backwards, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke, verse 24, from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said these words, Cursed be Canaan, servant of servants shall be to his brothers. And he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Before we get into the the depth of the drama here, with what happens to Noah and his sons, I want you to notice again what God says to us in verse 18 and 19. Um, Before this drama, again, we see that God keeps his promises. We see that God keeps his promises, and he also cares for the nations. And I want to point that out. So if you look at verse 18 and 19, um, even when we are faithless, God is faithful. I see God's faithfulness in really three areas. I see it in Noah's family. Look at the words. It says, Noah... Uh, his sons who went forth from the ark. These are the guys that went into the ark and they came out of the ark. It's a, it's a reminder of God's faithfulness that they did come in and they did go out. And then you see the three sons and you see what these sons represent. You, next week, we're going to see the table of nations and we're going to see where the nations come from. Effectively, all nations come from Ham, Shem, and Japheth and their lines. And so we see this table of na- nations. There's nobody on the earth except for this family and their wives. And so you see the earth being populated again by these three sons. And next week we'll see the bloodlines of these three sons as they come out. So God keeps his promises, but in seed form, you also see that God cares for the nations. These are a people that God knows. Um, God's not blind. He doesn't not know that what's going to come and what's going to happen. He knows that man again Earth 2.0, you're going to see the same thing from man. You're going to see his sin and his fall into sin. And yet God starts it over again. By his grace, he starts it over again with a people he he knows are going to fall. And so in that, you see a God who loves a lost people, a God who loves his nations. We're about to, in about a chapter and a half, we're about to get into how God hones in on the nation Israel, the Shemites. He hones in on that nation all the way through the Old Testament. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't care for the nations. Genesis 1 through 11 is very clear that God loves his people, even a lost people. He loves them and he wants worshipers from the people on his planet, from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And so he cares for the nations. There's some great application to this in in seed form as you look at it. The first thing to remember here is that God is is still, again, always trustworthy. He's always faithful. He always keeps his word. Do you see the creation ordinances in, in, in seed form here as well? Do you see that the pop, they were multiplying and filling the earth? So he's trustworthy to begin this again, to keep his word. And maybe we're sitting in a time where we're in trouble. Maybe you still feel like this is a time of trouble for you. I want you to know and I want you to remember every week that God is trustworthy and he's got you through this storm. And the second thing I would say is this, is that God has a missionary heart. He always has a missionary heart. He loves the nations, not just the nation Israel. He loves the nations and he wants worshipers from the nations. And you see it right here. He's populating the whole earth. He's going to 
see, you're going to see next week all these different nations, and he desires them to come and know him and be with him and worship him. So his heart, God's heart at, at the center of God's heart is a missionary heart. Let me ask you this morning, C3, do you have the heart of a missionary? Do you have God's heart? Do you see the nations? When you look at the nations and you see the nations rage and you see all the junk of the nations, does your heart bend and break? Or would you rather just stay here in America? Would you rather just focus your attention here? Do you look at the rest of the world and and, and other people groups and go, no. See, God has a heart for the nations. He has a heart for the ethnic groups of the world. This is the great commission call for us. Do you have a heart for your neighbor? Do you have a heart um, to church plant, both here and abroad? Do you have a heart for people who don't yet know Jesus? See, that's God's heart. He has a heart for lost people in a lost world. See, the joy in life as a Christian not only comes from knowing Christ and being with his people, but it also comes for being on mission. Like, we're not just the people that are, that are here to to navel gaze. We're a people that are on a mission. We are soldiers who have orders to be ambassadors to this world. So I I hope you're about the mission of God to take the gospel, the good news of Christ to the nations. This is God's heartbeat. Always has been, always will be from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And the the last thing I would say is this. Um, There's one family here that populates the whole earth. They're, they're, they're the same. Like they're, they're, they're siblings in a family who come from the line of Adam. And so as we saw in the beginning that we're made in the image of God, this has implications as we do some things. It has implications as we think about family history. It's really fun to, to look at Ancestry.com and learn about where you're from and what your bloodlines are. That's exciting stuff. But at the end of that um, But at the end of that, it all comes back to to these three sons. It comes back to this one family. And just like your family uh, looks like each other, at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, um, there's no really room for any superiority because of this. There's no room for classism. There's no room for superiority. There's no room for racism as we look at this family, the dispersed throughout the earth and that God will take in the next chapter and disperse through the earth, that we all come from one place. We're made of the same stuff. And so I know why racism, racism and classism and superiority exist. I know it's because of the fall, but it's completely nonsensical. You know, it's interesting because this passage is often used to justify. It has been in our country um, the sin of racism, but this t- passage actually te- teaches the very opposite, that we all come from a place. You know, it's nonsensical to me, and it pains me to think that this, a few months ago, and I'm only hearing about it really in the last few weeks, that there was a man in Georgia, Georgia, a 25-year-old man, who runs the same route in the same neighborhood, who lives two miles away, who's running in a neighborhood, and he gets looks like he gets gunned down in the middle of the day. He gets gunned down in the middle of the day because he fits the color description. His skin color fits the color description of a burglary that supposedly happened in the neighborhood. And men gun him down and kill him. And there's nothing done to these men. That they aren't taken into custody. That they're they're not arrested for over two and a half months. This is not just, and this is the pattern that we are seeing more and more, and I'm not the person to often bring this up, but this is the pattern in our world and in our country that we're seeing more and more. We need justice. We're in need of God's grace in all of this. See, God keeps his promises, and he cares for the nations. Is that our heartbeat? Is it our heartbeat to care for the nations? Is it our heartbeat to bring the gospel to the nations? We live in Houston, in the Houston area, We're the most ethnically diverse city in the country. The nations have effectively come to us. And this is the call for us as a church as we go out today to remember that God loves the nations as we ought to love them as well. But we haven't seen Noah yet, so we're going to get into the drama of the story here. Noah's looking kind of like the perfect human up to this point. But we get to verses 20 through 22, and we see something very different. We see his sin. 
See, here's what sin does in our lives. It exposes us to disgrace. And it can also trip others up. And this is what we see. We see him, a man of the soil. We see him making a vineyard, which is right and good. We see him drinking wine. And we see him drinking too much. We see him becoming drunk. And the Bible calls that sin. And then as a result of that sin, we see another sin, the exposing of his nakedness. And then you see the sun come in, the grown sun come in. And he doesn't cover his nakedness. He sees his nakedness. And then he walks out and he tells his brothers. It looks like what's happening here is Ham is mocking his dad. Ham is disrespecting his dad. And he's bringing more shame upon his dad by telling his brothers. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But sin exposes us to disgrace, and it can trip others up, and this is what we see in the passage. I want to take a few minutes and just look at what the Bible says about drunkenness and nakedness. See, wine in the Bible is a sign of blessing. It's a sign of God's good gifts and blessing, and yet too much of a good thing can be a bad thing, and you see that with alcohol through the Bible. Ephesians 5.18 says, don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery. Be drunk with the Holy Spirit. See, the problem with drunkenness is we reach a place in which we no longer have control of our faculties or our body, and even worse things happen after that. If we want to lose control of something, we let God, through His Spirit, work and control our lives is the message. But drunkenness is seen as a grave sin in the Bible. We see it through the Old Testament. We see the connection between drunkenness and nakedness. We see the connection between drunkenness and sexual sin all the way through the Bible, and you could think about examples of that, perhaps even in your own life or the life of others around you and how that's wrecked havoc on your life. And then we see, as a result of his drunkenness, that the, the, the text says that he exposed himself. There wasn't some weird, I don't think, some weird perverted thing that happened with Ham. There's a lot of um, ink that's been spilled on that, but I do think it's a perversion that, that Ham doesn't cover his father, that he allows the shame to continue. But man, in the Bible, you see the shame of nakedness. Remember in the garden, um, they were naked and they were not ashamed. And then one of the first results, the first result of sin is that mentally they knew their minds were perverted and they knew they were naked and they were ashamed. And if you come through the Bible, you, you see in Genesis 19, you see Lot and I can't even tell the story of Lot, but um, his daughters get him drunk, and there's awful things that happen in that. And then you come to Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18 outlines for the nation of Israel. It outlines sexual sin, and it spends about 13 verses saying this phrase from verses 6 all the way to about 17, somewhere in there. You shall not uncover the nakedness of dot, dot, dot. Your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, and then it lists some other sexual sins. This is God speaking through Moses to a people and say, you're not supposed to be like the Egyptians or the Canaanites, the place you were, the place that you're going. And he comes to the conclusion at the end and says, this is depravity. To, to open the nakedness, to look upon nakedness is sin. It's depravity, unless it's with your wife. And then you come to the last part of that passage in, in Leviticus 18, and it's really eerie. It's talking about the Canaanites, and, he, and God says the reason in which I'm kicking the Canaanites out is because of their sexual sin, and the land will spit them out. And then he turns to Israel, and he says, if you do this, the land will spit you out, and if you do this, um, you will be cut off. This is serious stuff in the Bible. It's not just cultural for Israel nakedness. You know, we often laugh at nakedness. We often watch things, perhaps, that we might be more careful to watch. But this is a son who is seeing and telling his brother. This is a stumbling block that's presented because of the sin of a, of a father. The point is this. The act of sin often leads to other sin, and it creates stumbling blocks for Noah's son, Ham. You know, I want to point out a couple of things as we try to apply this and we try to think about it. This is There's a lot here we could talk about. Noah's an older man here. He's already gone through the storm. He's gone through the storm of the flood. He's now in earth 2.0 and he's got a covenant with God and things are good and he's building um, back the earth. He's planted a vineyard, living the good life, and he falls into sin. It's an interesting thought. 
to think that oftentimes we fall when things are really good. The times of struggling and the times of trouble that we're attentive and we're dependent and then we let our guard down. Listen, older saints, it's really important. Until our dying breath, we have to fight sin. It's often an older age where we maybe have the the pride of saying, I'm older, I'm wiser, I've seen it before, I've seen your tricks, Satan. Um, Maybe many times in life, it is the older who falls into sin in in a later stage in his life. And you see that in the Bible. You see that with David. Remember David? He's hanging out on the porch or or the balcony, if you will. Um, The men are out to war because he's already won a bunch of battles. Life is good. And then he sees Bathsheba. You also see it at the end of later in Moses' life where he strikes the rock. He's already gone through all kinds of things. And later in life, he lets his guard down. Older saints, we can't do that. Um, When times are good, those are times where Satan tends to work, times we let our guard down. There's also, I I think, some application to the good gifts in life. I think wine and alcohol, they can be God's good gift to our life. I uh, I grew up in a... And in a home where there were, you, know, you didn't drink, you didn't play cards, and you didn't hang out with people who did. Um, and so that was kind of my upbringing. And yet I, I look at our, our, our Christian culture today, and, and it's, there's more freedom, and that can be a great thing. I enjoy a glass of wine. I enjoy a good craft beer. Um, I was in Austin a couple of weeks ago, and there was a beer I hadn't had in a while, and I just it, it tasted so good. The pecan porter, 512 pecan porter, they're bottling it now. It's great stuff. But, listen, um, as free evangelical Christians who exercise our freedom, my question for you is, do you have a boundary? Have you created a boundary line for yourself? I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about the boundary line between, hey, what's the point in which it's too much? What's the point in which this is sin? This is an important thing to do. I, my wife and I do this. We, we've created boundary lines, and we try to keep each other accountable to those. And my kids know about those. And my kids know that I'm not going to get drunk with wine. I'm not going to drink too many beers. And we have good conversations about those boundaries. And so that's a question you need to consider. Where, where's the boundary? Do you have a boundary? If you don't, why not? Um, if you don't have a boundary, is it just the way you feel or the situation with your kids during COVID-19 as to how much you're going to drink? I would encourage you to consider, to prayerfully consider having a boundary to help you because the progression of it tends not to move to less, but, but to move to more. If your body is telling you after three days of not having a drink that I really need this, maybe you consider what that looks like in your life. And last, I would say this. Um, Man, there is nothing worse um, as a parent that, that, than being the source of my kids' struggle or stumbling block. And if you haven't experienced that yet, you probably will. As a parent, um, you will, your actions as a fallen human being will have impact on your kids. But it's not if it will happen, but what you do when it does happen. I would encourage you to be a parent that confesses to your kid. It does not make you a lesser man or a lesser woman to confess your sins to your kids. Your kids need to hear that you're not perfect, that you're not gloating in it, but they need to hear that daddy messed up. They need to hear that I, mommy messed up. I raised my voice. I did this. I drank too much. Whatever it is, they need you to hear that from you. They need to hear your confession. They need to see that in you. You know, but some people, especially as you get older in life, you tend to hang on to the guilt that you have and the shame that you have and the regret regret that you have. And when you have, you know, young uh, adults that are having their own kids, sometimes when I know when I was a younger adult and starting to have kids, I thought I was going to do it all right and my parents did it all wrong. And maybe I didn't remember very well what, what life was really like when I was a kid. That was probably more likely. But be a blessing to your, to your parents. God's grace is sufficient to however your kids or your family is messed up. And so as a kid, maybe, maybe as a 20-something-year-old, as you look at your parents, encourage their hearts. Maybe they've made a lot of bad mistakes in your life. They need to be encouraged by you. They need to know that you, 
that they're forgiven for some of those things. And listen, if you are an older saint in this too, and, and, and shame just kind of owns you about how you raised your kids, I want you to know that your sin and your shame um, is taken at the cross. If you know Christ, that you can live in freedom. God doesn't want you to live in that. You may be real regrets that you have that have affected your kids, but God doesn't want you to live in the sin and the shame of that. And kids, I would just encourage you to, to be an encouragement to your parents, to give them some grace when they mess up. Most of your parents want to be good examples to you, so I'd encourage you in that. So sin surely exposes us to disgrace, and that's a hard thing. But I want you to see in this text really the focus for Moses is not the sin of Noah, but the sin of Ham, the son. And the response to sin in this text is really big. And the consequences are really large. And it really helps answer the question, does someone else's sin justify my sin and response? And the answer to this text is a resounding no. A resounding no. So kids, think about your parents, whether you're adult kids or, or, or you're younger. Um, you responding in sin does not justify um, and exempt you from what your parents have done. And that's a huge thing in this text. So I want you to see that. I want you to see it. See, here's the point as you look at the next few verses of this text. Our response, our cho choices have far-reaching cost. Our response has far-reaching response. Look, look at Ham. When he saw, he saw his father's nakedness, he mocked him. It looks like he disrespected him. And he went to increase the shame of his fathers by telling his brothers. He was saying, hey, look at our godly dad who has walked with the Lord and look at him now. That is gloating in someone else's sin. And we're never to do that. And this is what Ham does. He sees the nakedness of his father. He doesn't cover it. He tells his brothers, but look at the massive contrast in the way Shem and Japheth handle the situation. When they come in the room, when they hear what has happened, look at the text. Look at how they respond. Verse 23, Shem and Japheth took a garment. They laid it on both of their shoulders. And so here's the picture of what happens. The, Noah would be back here and he's exposed. His nakedness and drunkenness is exposed. They got shoulder to shoulder and they put a garment, a, a cloth over their shoulders and they walked backwards. They didn't look at their father's nakedness and his shame. That's honoring their father. They walked backwards and they put the covering over their father's naked body. That is how you honor your father. This is how you honor your parents, even in their sin, even when they sin against God, that you're still honoring <clears throat> to them. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the Bible, the Bible, when it comes to disrespecting of parents, the Bible doesn't mess around, kids. This is really important. This isn't true for little kids. It's also true for us adults who have parents that are older and maybe they're getting a little bit more honorary. We still have to honor them and respect them um, in that. It's important. It's really important if you look at the fifth commandment, honor your father and your, and, and your mother. Ephesians 6 takes the same passage and says, children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. So the first reason that you do it is because it's right, because God says to do it, not just because they provide for you, not just because they're older and wiser, but because God calls you to it, mom and dad, that's the biggest reason when you deal with disrespect in your kids, you've got to point them not to your standard, but to God's standard. And so it's incredibly important. And, and then the text says, honor your father and mother, for this is the commandment with a promise that it might go well for you and you live long in the, in the land. There's blessing that comes from honoring your parent. This is really important in our lives but look at the results. These results seem kind of like overkill when you read them. There's cursings because of disrespect of a father's sins. The father was naked and he was drunk. And it looks like Ham uh, laughed about it, mocked it, pointed it out to others. And look at how seriously the consequence for what he does is down in verse 24. Curse, this is Noah to Ham. So Ham's not cursed, but his son Canaan is cursed. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be to his brothers. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. Now, I don't think this curse is like some incantation, this demonic thing, this word over his son, um, this word over Ham and his son that projects 
into the future. I think it's more like Jacob's blessing and cursing in Genesis 48, where he observes the life of his son. And I think what's happening here in ways that Moses can't even understand is that I think what's happening here is that Noah is looking at his son. He's looking at the trajectory of his life, and he's looking at the way he acts and his disrespect. And he's saying, if you continue to do this, I, I, I can promise you that this is what's going to happen. That, the, the, that this is going to happen to your son and his sons. And I think God also uses this in a prophetic way because this certainly happens in the life of Canaan and the life of the Canaanites. All you have to look, do is look through the history of the Canaanites and see their sexual perversion, to see their disgrace, to see their sin, to see their dishonor. And so he multiplies this in the life of his son and their descendants. It's kind of like, but, but, but I would look at it kind of like this. When I think of my, my kids and I ask them to do a chore or something and they do it about halfway and have to tell them three or four times, the thing that I might say to them, which I have, they would tell you that I've said this, man, if you had a job and your employer asked you to do this, they would fire you right now for not doing a good job. So I'm projecting into the future. And so I think this is probably what's happening here is that Ham's lifestyle is being seen by his father. And surely there's the cursing, the prophetic cursing that happens uh, to Canaan. And the future is to the Canaanites and to see all of their sin. And so surely it's prophetic. And this actually happened. If you look at the text, it says, A servant of servants. When the people of God came into the land, that's what happened. Joshua took the land and these Canaanites became servants of the Shemites. Um, the Israelites in the land. So this surely happened in this time. And here's the primary reason I think you have this text here. It's meant Moses is showing the people that are about to go into the promised land. He's showing them that the Canaanites are already cursed. The Canaanites are already going to be, uh, we're, they're already going to be your servants. Do you know how important that would be for an Israelite that's looking at the mighty Canaanites and their people in the land to give them courage and to give them faith that God's already got this. He, he's promised you the land, but look back at the example. The root cause of this is because of the sin of Ham in this text. So it's cursed be Ham, but look at the blessing. You see the blessing as well. The blessing goes to both Shem, which we discover in this text, but blessed be the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Shem. So guess what? Um, when you go back to Genesis chapter 3, remember Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve had sinned, you see this promise of a redeemer. You see this first gospel that um, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. And so we've been tracing the lineage of Messiah, Jesus, in this line. And so this helps us understand that, that Messiah will come from the line of Shem. It won't be Noah, the man who brought rest. He's about to die, but it certainly will be from the line of Shem. And you get to chapter 12 and you see... Um, Abram's father from the line of Shem, and you, then you see the, the Abrahamic covenant. You see land, seed, and blessing, and the blessing is, is that God will bless the, all the earth through the line of Shem. And so what a great promise we have right here in this text. That's a lot of, about those few verses in that, but I want you to remember the garden. I want you to remember what God did with Adam and Eve when they fell into sin and they were naked. What does he do? He, in a unique way that only God can do, he covered their sin. He covered their sin with the blood of an animal. And then you come to this text and you have a father who needs covering and you have sons who cover him up. I think there's an important message for us in this as you think about other people that sin or maybe when you fall into sin and shame and disgrace, that you need other people not to gloat over your sin, not to expose your sin to the world, but you need people, brothers and sisters, who will come alongside of you as you repent and as you confess, that will walk with you and cover your sin and your shame and remind you who you are in Christ. That's what it looks like to walk with God with a people. And I don't know all the stories in this church, but I've heard so many stories of this church doing this well, that you didn't... Um, bring more shame upon a situation, but you brought the healing balm of Christ to a situation that needed help. This is the testimony of Christ Community Church that I've heard for a while, and that's a beautiful thing, and we ought to be that kind of people where we don't gloat over people's sin, but we walk with them when they fall, that we help pick them up and point them to Christ. That 
is a great application of this text. We need to be like Shem and Japheth um, in people's and through people's sin to walk with them. You and I would want that if we have fallen into sin and shame. And so we ought to approach it that way. And to kids, I would say it this way. It's really important. You know, it's really easy to justify your own actions when someone else sins against you, when, when someone else sins, especially your parents. But this message, this text right here tells you, listen, this is really important, that even, even when your, your parents have fallen into sin, you still need to honor them. You still need to find a way to respect them, find a way not to, to, to hurt them by opening up their shame. That's a huge thing. And so even in the course of normal life, that makes it even more important that you honor and respect your parents. And adults, many of you still have living parents you're called to honor them and care for them. Um, we're not called to, to talk about them behind their back, but to care for them. And there's also a warning here. There's warnings about a lot of things in this text, but I think there's a warning here about nakedness and about sexual perversion. And it's sinful and shameful to look upon nakedness. I'm talking about your spouse, um, but we live in a culture that's completely desensitized to nakedness, whether it's the, the shows or pornography that we struggle with. We need to be careful what we see, careful little eyes what we see, careful big eyes what you see. There's a warning here. And last, I, I think I'm compelled to say this because we talk about generation, people end up talking about generational curses when we come to curses and blessings based on obedience and disobedience. And I'm compelled to say that you can break the cycle in your own family, that the gospel frees you that the bonds of sin are broken for you, that you can change the cycle. Maybe you have a history of alcoholism. Maybe you have a history in your family of divorce. You can change that through the power of the Spirit and the gospel work in your life. So listen, you see this snowball effect in a family, in Noah's family. It's so sad. Um, but you see God's grace for the nations in the beginning, and you're going to see God's grace for the nations in the end. Here's the point. We are all in need of God's grace. Look at verse 26. For he also said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of the name, literally the God of the name, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. See, the line of Christ was going to come through the line uh, of Shem. And you see, like I said a minute ago in Genesis 12, that all the families of the earth would be blessed through this line. Hope comes from God, the God of the name. You know, parents... Maybe you're like Noah. Maybe there's things that you fall into sin over. There's struggles that you have and your kids see them. There is grace for you. And you need to hear that. There's grace from Christ for you. And maybe if you're a son grown or young or a daughter grown or young, and it's very hard for you to respect and honor your parents. It's very hard for you not to shame them. There is grace for you as well. And perhaps you're even like the Canaanite that we see in this text. And we see in the Old Testament that you are totally marked. Your life is marked by sin. I would say to you, whether you're a Hamite, whether you're a Japhethite, whether you're a Shemite, I'm going to tell you who those people are uh, this next week. You're all in need of God's grace. And it doesn't matter where you're from. And it doesn't matter what you've done. That there's grace for you. You see, we find ultimately grace that's wrapped up in the person and work of Christ. A Shemite, he's from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who would bless the families of the earth. But I want to remind you of something. Jesus, his seven greats back grandmother, was Rahab the harlot, who was a Canaanite. Listen, the mixed blood of Jesus can cover and take away your sin no matter what you've done or where you're from. You see, God's grace is available to you today. The good news of the gospel is Christ has died in your place. And whatever you've done can be laid on him who knew no sin. He took your sin upon himself. And so he freely invites you to come to him, to come and confess your need for him and repent and turn and by faith trust in the finished work of Christ. God bless you. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this word. There's so much here that we can apply to our lives. We thank you for the grace of God. We thank you that you're a gracious God. We don't deserve any of it, and you would be just 
to leave us where we're at. And yet you have provided your son to die on a cross for our sin. He didn't deserve that. We deserve that. But he took our place. And so, Lord, I pray for one maybe this morning who's never heard that message, who's trying to create an image in their life to portray a certain kind of lifestyle, a certain type of person. Lord, we want to be like Jesus because he was the perfect man. He was God in the flesh. And so, Lord, we pray that we would, in our sin, that we would not stay in disgrace, but we would come to you where you give us rest. You give us your grace through your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, we come to the table as we do each week, remembering uh, what Christ did on a cross on our behalf, where he shed his blood for us and uh, he bore our sin and shame. And he broke his body for us. And so we want to remember that we are in need, as we talked about this morning, we're in need of his grace. And so we come together celebrating the Lord's table. We come together reflecting as well on the great price in which Christ paid for us. We also come reflecting on our own lives. If there's anything that we have um, that, that's separating us in a relationship or with God, that we want to confess those things before we come to the table. So I invite you for the next few minutes before you take um, to just consider um, anything you need to bring to God um, that you might turn from, that you might come to his table. He invites you to his table. You're a part. If you know Christ, you're, you're, you're at his table. He's made you an adopted son or daughter. And so you come to the table when you're ready to take this morning. Father, we confess that we're unworthy. We're unworthy of the great sacrifice in which Christ uh, paid for us on a cross. But we come rejoicing. The Bible says that uh, communion, a time where we come to your table, is a time to proclaim the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ until he comes back. And so we're thankful. We want to be a thankful people for uh, what Christ has done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hey church, we wanted to give you another chance to hear from one of our elder candidates. Most of you know Jim Cohn. If you don't, uh, looking forward for the opportunity for you to get to know him. Before I really knew Jim, I knew about Jim. That tends to be the case when you're a person who serves people well and cares for people well. And so it's a delight, Jim, to uh, have you uh, here uh, thinking about eldership. And so I wanted to put you on the hot seat for a little bit and ask you a few questions. Uh, tell us a little bit about your faith and, and the ways in which God is growing you. Well, um, I came to faith many, many years ago. Uh, I was at the age of 10 in a, a Presbyterian church in California and um, grew up in a home where my mother was extremely faithful. Uh, served in a Methodist church in Michigan until her passing last uh, April for 46 years. And, but she was always a, the pillar of faith, as they say, in our family. And uh, my father was a military officer, and he was very uh, uh, stoic, but also very faithful as well. And so it was fairly natural for me to be at least exposed to uh, a church and being in a church environment. And so I was afforded that opportunity. And um, uh, what I learned through the years um, uh, was that um, I really didn't understand uh, what Christianity and what faith was all about. And uh, later on uh, in the 80s, I became a, an active member of a, of a Presbyterian church uh, down in 1960 for about 10 years in the uh, 1980s and um, realized that I was just kind of going through the motions, um, doing all the things I was supposed to do, and it looked pretty good at the time. Uh, but um, I, I didn't really have a relationship with Christ. And uh, I had what was what I would consider a bad breakup with the church. Um, I went through a difficult time in my marriage, which ended up in eventual divorce. And um, at the time, I felt like the the church was responsible for for my happiness and uh, to to feed me. And um, uh, obviously, I was mistaken, but uh, that was a learning experience for me. So um, fast forward. Uh, uh, several years and uh, uh, with the advent of uh, meeting my wife and um, God put her and um, her two children in my life and uh, as he does often he uh, he works or changes us through uh, through people and through circumstance and so um, that began a real uh, change in in my spiritual life and my belief system and um, uh, that was uh, really augmented by um, 
God's grace, he, he never gave up on me, uh, which is, you know, I gave him plenty of opportunity. Uh, it was really one of those things that's uh, uh, still kind of remarkable when you think about the, um, the, the, the way I uh, didn't honor him and uh, the things that I did that I shouldn't have. Um, uh, it just really, it, it's just lends credence to the idea that he is mighty, he is powerful, and he is faithful and gracious. And um, that he basically proved that mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the last six years, as we've been members of uh, C3, um, uh, we, we as, a, as a couple and as a family have grown to really love this church body. Mm -hmm. And God has uh, revealed more and more of his plan for me as, as I've moved forward. And um, I'm really excited about uh, the tremendous changes in the last six six years, particularly here at, uh, at C3. Um, and uh, so he's still working on me, and I am grateful for that. Uh, I mean, and when you think about the, the, um, the history of the gospel and, um, and how he has uh, he's done that in so many lives, you know, it's just hard to believe that you wouldn't want to share that mm -hmm. and um, live a life of gratitude. And so uh, that's, that's it. Good stuff. You know, it's neat, as you said, that uh, God never gave up on you. It's neat to see you not give up on people. When I think of Jim Cohen, I think of a guy who doesn't give up on people and cares for people really well. So tell us a little bit about your family. You alluded to it a little bit. Um, how do you seek to, to love your family and care for your family? We're called to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the, of the Lord. And um, I really didn't do that well. Um, I, I didn't do it. And um, fortunately, uh, when I met Leron, um, uh, some 30 plus years, 33 years ago now, uh, she um, had a stabilizing force in my life and um, God was working on me through her, uh, no question, and still is, of course. Uh, and uh, she, um, she really helped uh, ground me and uh, bring me back to uh, the important uh, uh, things that I need to look at. So uh, I feel like I've gotten a second chance, so to speak, and, and I will, I'll describe my family. I, I should have done that right off, but uh, we're raising a, a little guy named King. Uh, he's been with us for, since he was about three or four months old, and he's, he just turned three in January. So, um, But I am doing a better job, I think. Um, I don't, I, with him I am, um, but I do have three uh, sons, one daughter, Three beautiful daughter-in-laws, one son-in-law. I have six grandsons. I have, four. I have one granddaughter, and we have King. So uh, we we have a lot of a uh, lot of fun and a big family. Uh, in our beautiful family. family. Yeah, absolutely. Well, tell us a little bit how if you come on the elder team, how would you shepherd people here at C3? What what does that look like for you? Um, I, I view uh, myself as a servant leader. Um, have in business for 46, seven years. Um, I feel like in life and in church as well that servant leadership is, uh, um, is the key to success from a standpoint of, of, uh, of helping people get the most out of their gifts. Um, and realize the best way to honor God. And um, you know, Christ said himself that um, he was here among us uh, to serve in Luke, uh, Luke 22, uh, 27. The, the point is that um, I feel like the best way I can support C3 and the people here that we love um, is to serve them yeah. and um, serve the community, serve God, serve um, period um, in, in every way that I can. And um, I appreciate so appreciate your heart for mission um, and uh, and for people and uh, you've brought that into focus for us as a church uh, and, uh, and and it's something for us to focus on and um, I really appreciate that as well as um, all of the the elder team um, I, I'm, I can't even tell you the, how humbled and honored I am to be just included in this this group of men um, that um, that uh, that, we're, that we'll be um, elders, uh, us as elder candidates, myself and Chris and Wheeler. Um, I'm just really, really honored, and um, I appreciate that. Well, thanks for sharing. I really appreciate it. And as a church, uh, we want you to prayerfully consider uh, what you're hearing. Uh, consider the Bible. 
describes, a shepherd describes, an elder is a man who's above reproach, a man who understands God's word, a man who wants to uh, shepherd God's people. And so if you're a member of the church, we'd encourage you to prayerfully consider Jim and that. And uh, about mid-May, we will work through kind of the final steps of the process to bring Jim and Wheeler and Chris hopefully on our, our elder team, but we want to invite you to be a part of that process. So reach out to Jim if you need to, ask him any questions you want, reach out to us, uh, but thanks for listening. Well, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Uh, go spoil your mom today. Happy Mother's Day. God bless you.